All right, let me uh, begin by thanking John um, first for just genuinely inviting me, but also, also as we put from my comments, I'm a big proponent of diversity. I'm a microeconomist who studies diversity, so I think it's a very brave thing to invite that sort of person to a macro conference, so it's great to be here. What I want is I want to talk about agent-based models and their realized contribution to macroeconomics, but also the potential contribution to macroeconomics. To frame this, let me start out by talking a little bit about sort of what agent-based models are and what complex systems are, which is the area that I sort of traffic in as does Dome. Um, so when we think about a complex system, what we think about is a system that consists of a bunch of entities that tend to be diverse, and they're connected to one another through some sort of context structure. Within that context structure, they get local information as well as the aggregate information. And then they adapt to that in some way, producing some sort of pattern. So that's what a complex system is. It's diverse parts in a network adapting in some way. When we speak about complexity, what we're talking about is in some sense the phenomena, some way of measuring or capturing the phenomena that those systems produce. So there's complexity is something like culture. So if you look up culture, it's like 179 different definitions. Complexity is only got about 68, but we're catching. <laughs> if you look at those definitions, they fall into two broad categories. One is sort of a statistical view, where complexity is somewhere between order on the one hand and pure randomness on the other. The other sort of classification fall into something I call sort of deep, which stands for sort of difficult to explain, difficult to engineer, or difficult to predict. So there's things like thermodynamic depth. There's this stuff by Jim Crutchfield and Cosmo Shalizi, which looks at sort of how complex do the machines have to be to predict things. But if you go way back to things like Kolmogorov complexity, that's sort of how hard is it to describe something. So when we think about agent-based models, what are these? These are very simple computer models that start with little objects called agents, connect them in some way, and then sort of just let them evolve and see what happens. And what I want to talk about how that is a completely different paradigm, has had something to offer, may have even more to offer to macroeconomics. OK, so here's a brief problem I want to do. First of all, I'm just giving you sort of some sense of systemically why complex is different than equilibrium. Then we're talking very briefly about something I call Solo's Wager, or DSG Plus, which Mark hit at his talk. Then I'm going to show you four versions of sort of what I'm going to call the full Monty. These are million agent <coughs> models, one done by Doan, um, and one done by uh, a group of people um, in Italy. And then I'm going to talk about the potential. So this is sort of the, the basic outline of the talk. So the properties, I run something called the Center for the Study of Complex Systems, but we joke it should be called the center for the study of systems that could be complex. <laughs> because when you set up a complex system, there's four things that can happen. So both Stephen Wolfram, who's you know, well known for his work on complexity, and Norm Packer, who's also one of the founders of complexity research, when they talk about complex systems, they really mean systems that can produce one of four things. They can go to equilibria, they can produce sort of simple patterns, they can be completely random, or they can be complex. And so some of the real nice contributions originally from complexity theory have been that very simple systems can create all, all four of these things. So Wolfram, in some sense, his fundamental contribution has been that with extremely simple cyber automata models, you can create pure randomness, computation, simple patterns, and equilibrium. Now, when we look at these systems, they're remarkable oftentimes because they're robust. So the brain is an incredibly robust thing. Like you can pull out, neurons are dying, you know, growing new connections all the time, they continue to function. Ecosystems have species coming in and out, they continue to work. So it's sort of amazing that this sort of happens. It's also true because there's so much interdependency in these systems. If you look at the statistics that come from them, you, you see some normal distributions, but you also see a lot of sort of long tail distributions. So you see the things that we also can see in financial market data and economic data. Now, when topic systems research first got started 25, 30 years ago, my friend Michael Cohen used to refer to it as the festival of bad metaphors. Right? So <laughs> people talked about things like the edge of chaos and stuff like this. And there's been real work towards trying to put, sort of speak math to metaphor, if you will. And so two concepts, I think, initially that were entangled and are disentangled is one is self-organization, which is this idea that if simple things following simple rules can self-organize into patterns. So things like you know, birds flocking, fish schooling, that sort of stuff. It's also the case that you know, we call emergence. And emergence refers to things, and Rob Axtell's done nice work on this, where the system exhibits properties that cannot exist of individual parts. So when we talk about an ecosystem being robust, or a brain having cognition, or a brain having personality, that's something that the parts can't have. So there's system level properties that emerge, and they're not built in. There's no central planner that creates these things. But at the same time, with all this sort of wonder within complex systems, one of the things that I think that we've learned to keep in mind, and this is where the sort of, sort of wet blanket on the festival of bad metaphors, is it's still the case that accounting laws and physical laws still have to hold. Right? So Jeffrey West has done a lot of nice work on sort of power laws, where 
one of the things that drives a lot of these results is the fact that there's just some physical laws that just have to hold. OK, so that's sort of you know, a quick primer on what complex systems are. So now there's something I call Solo's Wager. So when I first start, started thinking about complex systems as an economist, I had this very sort of naive view, which is that you could sort of just add these things in. Right? And Mark hinted at this as well. When you think about, you know, you've got a standard model, let's just throw in some heterogeneity. And Alan Kerman's done some wonderful work on this and showing that you can't necessarily just add in. It can sometimes change the model fundamentally. Let's add in adaptation. Let's throw in networks, those sort of things. What's interesting when you do that, and the longer version of slides I put out, if you throw in one of these things, oftentimes it doesn't matter. But when you throw in two of these things, now the covariance between those things matters. And when you throw in three of these things, the covariance between all three things matters, and it starts to slowly fall apart. People used to sort of explain this, I think incorrectly, they'd sort of say, take your standard model, throw in networks, it's like lifting this leg, and it still works. And you say, let's throw in heterogeneity, we lift this leg, and it still works. But if you put them both in, you're sitting on your butt. Right? I think that that's not quite right. I think it's more just sort of a slow degradation of the model as you start adding in more and more of these features. And it'll, it's also the sense that by, as you add in these features, you start looking through different lenses, because you look at the world in a different way. But that's not to say that there hasn't been some really strong lessons learned from the macro models that have included these sorts of things. So when you think about including heterogeneity, we recognize that identical people can vary in their consumption of income and wealth. Right? So, it isn't the same, the case necessarily that things cancel out. It's also the case when you put in incomplete markets, I think you start to see, and there's some wonderful work in this Keith code, has a wonderful survey article, and I'm sure most of you probably read it, so I won't bother going through it, just on how when you throw in incomplete markets and borrowing constraints, you start seeing real implications for of heterogeneity. Now, I think what most interests me, though, in this space is that when agent-based models first started coming out about 25 years ago, people say there's all sorts of things you can't answer in the standard model. That almost became a challenge to economists, and they answered all of them, right? So things like bankruptcy, unemployment insurance, geographic dispersion, safety net policies, if you've got, in a, in a sort of boilerplate caricature of the standard model, you can't do these things, right? But the fact is, we figured out how to do DSG plus and sort of, you know, include them in, in those effects. But the point is, when you do this, when you do DSG plus, you're still sort of within that general framework. You're still thinking about things in terms of equilibria, and shocks to equilibrium. So when I explain this to my undergraduates, I basically say, imagine a dog chasing a rabbit around the yard. Think of the rabbit R as random, and the dog D as deterministic. DSG is this view that the rabbit makes a move, and there's this deterministic process heading to the rabbit. And the rabbit makes another move, and you head to the rabbit again. Complex systems is an attempt to model the rabbit. Right? So it's to have both the rabbit and the process moving one another. Now this notion of the plus gets criticized within complex systems, and here's sort of um, Giovanni Dossi, who writes better than anybody I know in this area in terms of just his lyricism, he contrasts the DSG plus agenda to sort of adding epicycles, right, to the Earth centric view <laughs> of the universe. You can keep adding stuff in to the other model trying to fit the data, you're sort of missing the point. And the point is that the economy isn't the dog chasing the rabbit, instead, it's a complex system that's constantly evolving and churning. So, what have we done? What do the models look like? And here we're going to see. I'll just give you four. The first one's going to be a model that just attempts to show proof and concepts, one of the early ones. You just sort of say, can you actually construct artificial worlds that look like worlds? Then I'll show you two in a little more detail that actually try and fit data, and then I'll sort of outline a larger effort. But what you want to think of here is you want to think of sort of two-part harmony. And the two-part harmony is this. The way you model individuals, and somebody earlier mentioned Giger and um, the way you model individuals in an agent-based model is you think of them as rule-based. So there's basically three views of people that are out there in social science. One is sort of the rational view with beliefs added on. So you can think of this as belief, you know, sort of rationality, there's uncertainty, you, act, you optimize with respect to those beliefs. The other is sort of the bias literature, right? The common diversity notion that well, we don't quite do that because our brains are structured in a way that we make mistakes. The third way, which is the complex systems view, is that we're actually bundles of behavior. That over time we accumulate heuristics, rules of thumb, subroutines to sort of deal with the reality we're coping with. And that what the economy consists of is the aggregation of all those rules. So that's the first thing. Now, when you think of firms, what we, you try to do is you think of exactly the same sorts of thing. You think of firms as also having behavior. So the thing is, there's some firms that want to grow. There's other firms that don't want to grow. So if you actually look at the correlation between the rate at which firms grow and their productivity, it's actually not that correlated. Right? Whereas if you're on a naive model, you think firms that are making lots of money should grow a lot, and firms that aren't shouldn't. But it depends on all sorts of things, right? It depends on the organizational structure of the firm, 
right? Is it easy for them to grow or not easy for them to grow? It depends on their projections of what the markets can look like, all sorts of things. So what we often do in these agent-based models is actually try and fit the data to what firms are doing. So let me start with sort of one of the first agent-based models, and this is a um, variant by Blake LeBaron, but this was sort of sometimes called the Santa Fe stock market model. And what they want to do is they just want to say, can we come up with a, like a model of a stock market that looks sort of like a stock market? So what you've got here is these trading rules. These are these like behaviors that these agents are all following. So each person has these bundle of rules. And like the attention models that Ricardo was talking about, I'm sort of like, I can only keep so many models in play. So I may have six models in my head in play, and I'm going to use the one that seems to be working best over some past window. And then what you do is you try and put in as accurately as you can some sort of market microstructure. And what's going to happen is you're going to get things like emergent wealth structure. But there's no attempt here to fit to data. The question is, if you just set something like this up, <clears throat> what does it look like? And so the goal here is just to fit some stylized facts. So can you get persistent volatility? Do you get kurtosis? Do you get lots of volume? Right, that sort of thing. And so what they did is they said, look, there's two, there's, um, two assets. There's an equity and a cash. The equity asset has a normal return to it. There's agents. Um, they have long-term memory and short-term memory traders. Here's the 250 rules. So this is this idea of a complex system. This is this ecology of rules. Right? And if you go bankrupt, you just get replaced. Okay? And the time period here is one week. And so what you get is you get, you know, here the red line is what the equilibrium price should be from the fundamentals. The blue line is the price you get in the market. So one of the things you see here is you see this sort of nice excess volatility. If you look at sort of um, the S&P 500 versus the rational price according to Schiller, it looks something like that. So early on in these models, they said, look, we can create stuff that looks more like real economies than these rational models. So this was sort of the promise. But there's a sense mm -hmm. in which at that point it was an empty promise, and the reason why is we didn't have enough data. So it's great to say we, sh we should model the whole economy, but you sort of couldn't do it. But luckily, things have changed, right? And we can, we can edit. Here's one more thing, right? Absolute returns, autocorrelation versus weekly returns, S&P 500 simulation. Again, you see the same sort of fitting the data. Well, now, I should maybe just hand the thing to Dome. He can explain this. But so, um, John Ginnikopoulos, Rob Extel, Dome Farmer, have been working on models of housing markets, right? So here's just looking at prepayment decisions. So instead of looking at something like an entire stock market, we're just going to look at prepayment decisions. And they've got 2.2 million agents, and they're going to fit this to actual data. So the objective here is to improve on the old model. Now, what did the old model look like? He basically ran you know, just a standard sort of regression model where he said, look, the age of the loan, seasonality, there's a rate change, there's some sort of burnout in terms of maybe I should you know, refinance, but the fact is I'm just tired of working interest rates, and all sorts of other parameters like the age of the person, their income, and that sort of stuff. Okay? And the burnout is just the summer rate change in previous periods. Okay, so their model basically says, look, there's a cost, an alertness, and the probability you're going to sell your house. The cost is going to be decreasing over time, the alertness is increasing, and then the probability of sell has parameters not unlike some of the other parameters in the um, standard model. But in this case, burnout is actually going to emerge in the models instead of being assumed. And so what they get is conditional prepayment rates they can pretty accurately predict. So this is what they predict, the red line and the actual the black line. And you have to look at this, and you can say, okay, this is overfitting, they've got 2.2 million agents, but actually, they've got 2.2 million agents, so they don't have that many free parameters in their model. So if you look at this, this is actually, I think, incredibly impressive. Now, one of the things that comes up, though, which is really interesting, yeah, okay, is that when they do this, they find that in the first decade of 2000, they've suddenly got to change the rule people are following. Like, now people start suddenly, because interest rates on credit cards are really high, interest rates on homes are really low, and so people change what they're doing. So in their model, they've got to change what people do in 2000. And this is the fundamental criticism of agent-based models. If I've got a rational choice model, that stays the same always, right? And so yeah, maybe there's some deviations, or if you think of a bias model, you know, nobody's going to get rid of the anchor and the adjustment bias tomorrow, right? You just keep it in there every time. But in agent-based models, we think about these sort of sets of rules that are going on in the ecology, and you're estimating those can turn on a dime as they appear to in 2000. Okay, so what you can have is you can have an advanced model then that basically then takes into account this behavior. And if you do that, which is what they did, then you can fit the data after 2000. So you just sort of fix the model as you go. And if you look at a bunch of parameters, right, what you see, and I'm going to go to this, you see that the model, even after this break, does an incredibly nice job of fitting the data. All right, another one. Rob Axtell has a big labor market model. And here what he does, he wants a, a model that produces the static characteristics of the labor market, 
I don't want to go into this too much, but he's basically going to fit the firm distribution, right? So firm size, growth, age, output, turnover, all these sorts of things. And then he's going to have model firm dynamics. And he's going to include in here a full labor market. Okay. So this is like literally a model of the entire um, labor market within firms. In here, he's got agents with comp WH utility functions for income and leisure. They put forth ability and effort. Basically, the model works like this. As a firm gets more and more able people, it does better, but then people start slacking off, right? Because the firm's making lots of money, and then eventually maybe that firm will die. So what you see is you see firms growing and falling off. And what's interesting, even with that simple setup, he ends up getting stuff that fits the data really well. So here's sort of the survival probability of firms as a function of their age, right? Or if uh, the, um, this is the, what's the second one? Oh, and firm age distribution over time. What you see is that his model comes really close. These are all different ones of his model to the actual data. So here's by basically fitting things at the micro level, he's fitting things at the macro level. And here's stationary firm size distributions for his firms. Um, this is the, uh, for, these are for his firms for output and number of workers. And these also fit real world data really nicely. So what Rob argues in his piece is that if you actually can get the micro assumptions approximate with respect to all these distributions, right? So think about all the distributions of firm size. And think of all the distributions of sort of how these firms respond to macro shocks, then you might be able to get the macro correct, at least in pattern. So instead of fitting means, or instead of even fitting sort of you know, variances, he's trying to fit patterns by fitting patterns of behaviors and stuff. OK, then you can go even one step further. And um, my discussion, Domenico is working on something like this as well, talking about for David's project here. But there's economy-wide models. So there's people now trying to fit these giant agent-based models of the entire economy. And these models look like this. I mean, they've got firms, they've got central banks, they've got assets markets, goods market, labor markets, they've got governments, they got everything. And you, you know, try and you try and fit everything into distributions, you try and get the whole thing to work. And within these, you can do policy experiments. Now, looking in the crowd and seeing a lot of dubious basis, that's good, right? Because I think we should at this point be somewhat dubious. This is in its infancy. But one thing I think that's really, I think important about this sort of work is, you know, Ricardo, when somebody brings up an idea at one of these seminars, people often say, Ricardo said it, he said, that's a good idea, somebody tried to pick on that. And then he said, wait, I'm writing a paper, you can't. Okay? Well, the thing is, you can't sort of say, wait, nobody read, a, nobody read an HBS bubble in the entire economy, because I'll do one this afternoon. That's problematic. To do something like this takes a long list of co-authors, a big budget, lots of data, those sorts of things. So it actually takes overcoming a collective action problem and economics is set up differently than things like ecology and physics and those sort of things. We don't necessarily do things in huge groups like this. And so sometimes people say, well, if these things work, we'd see a lot of them. One reason we probably don't see a lot of them is we've got to overcome the problem in terms of how our discipline is organized if we want to do something like this. OK, so what's the potential? Why should we do it? So the first one is it's just an alternative discipline. So it is a disciplined way of thinking. It's a way that a lot of physicists think. It's a way a lot of ontologists think. It's a lot of, way a lot of uh, computer scientists think. So there's discipline to this thinking. There's a logic enforced by the computer program. So if you think of DSGE models, right, these are basically the, the discipline here comes from the logic. Everything's got to fit. And so as a result, there is um, this admiration of sort of parsimony, right, within this class of models. With an ancient base models, the discipline is you sort of, in some sense, got to be linked to data in some way. You've got to get these distributions correct. And you also have to think really hard about what are the behaviors of the agent. <coughs> now, it doesn't mean there are a lot of agent-based models that are just toy models, where we don't care about any of those things per se, where we're just trying to understand the methodology and how things add up. Because, because these things are complex, they're hard to understand. When you think about an agent-based macro model, the discipline comes in from the data, and specifically not just means the distribution. The other thing is, once you start doing this, you recognize that you've got to look at different data and more data. Because again, you're not just looking at means, you're looking at sort of, can you break things down? So one place where this stuff has actually had a lot of impact is within the industry. So Caterpillar, Procter & Gamble, all sorts of firms use agent-based models to understand their markets. And they break down their entire consumer base into types of consumers. They know the distributions of each one. And when they figure out what happens if we raise the price of you know, pressed toothpaste by 5%, they know how that's going to play in each market and for each consumer group, right, based on these elaborate models. But when you think of the data we get, right, you've got to think about, you know, um, can we actually in real time get data that would be meaningful for these models? And the reality was 25 years ago we couldn't. And I think that's why these things maybe didn't take off as fast as they could have. But now you can, right? So we talked about some people put this up before, 
But if you look at sort of Google searches for property management or real estate agencies, and look at that in terms of how that relates to good um, houses sold, you see that you can actually get at these sets of behaviors. Or if you look at, in Canada, the same sort of thing for mortgage rates, you see these sort of patterns for these things. You can understand these behavioral changes. This works in other disciplines really well. So the CDC, right, most of you probably know has data on flu activity. You can also look at Google searches, right? And you can sort of use that to predict what's going on. So one of the things we can do is pull from the web all sorts of interesting data about behavior um, that we can then plug back into the model. Now, one of the things I think that will come from this is so, I, I call this the largest integer problem. Because here's the funky thing. I was talking to my undergrads about this, and I said, they said, I had to cancel class today. And I said, so I'm going to a place where the caricature is there's people who study agents with one model. And I'm going to talk to them about agents' models with 2.2 million agents. <laughs> right? So from one agent to 2.2, the reality is there's probably a correct largest integer. I don't know if we have to go all the way to 2.2, but one reason why it's worth sort of exploring these things is to figure out how big do we have to make them? How many agents do you need right, to solve these things? And I think that would be a useful thing to figure out. Now, the other thing you can do with these models, which I think is really fascinating, is by putting in all the market microstructure you can actually get the second eigenvalue. What do I mean by this? So if I, this is my character term. Feel free to correct me um, in the discussion. I'm sure people will. But when I think about how we make predictions about the macro economy in the United States, what we do is we have people who sort of talk about in big aggregates. And then it breaks down where somebody talks about housing, manufacturing, service, retail, and all those things. And we sort of add them up. And I think we get the first sort of eigenvalue, the first you know, sort of the rate of growth right. But we don't get the interaction terms right. And if you actually fit like a full, you know, this is going back to sort of input-output matrix sort of stuff. But if you actually go back and do that, think about how all the firms are connected to one another, you can actually solve for these second order effects. Let me show specifically what I mean. So Hausman and Hidalgo, they have this nice work on sort of this economic atlas of complexity. Now what they do is pretty simple. For each country and each product, they just put a one there if you make the product and a zero if you don't make the product. And the diversity is how many products you make and the ubiquity is how many other countries make your product. Well, then what you can do is you can basically normalize this matrix. And if you take it times its transpose, that gives you ubiquity weight and diversity. Because you can be diverse, but be making stuff that lots of other people make. And that's not the same as being diverse and making stuff that other people don't make, right, in terms of what your market power is going to be. So these things, since it's normalized, the first eigenvalue is one, but the second eigenvalue is going to predict, in some sense, is what they call the complexity of the economy. It's basically telling you, sort of, are you in a lot of industries that there are not a lot of other people in? And so if you look at the complexity rankings of different countries, they look pretty much like this over time. Um, very clear. But if you look at them like this, and you look at, yep, um, if you look at sort of the complexity ranking on this, and then income on this axis, you see that there's, you know, fairly strong correlation. Same sort of thing goes for growth. Now, this work has been criticized by lots of people, but it's also been sort of, I think, seen as provocative by lots of people. And I think that that's and so maybe the right way to think about agent-based models at this point, and these very microstructured models of large systems at this point. They're very provocative. They force us to look at data different ways. And um, they may help us sort of understand gaps that are not. Now, the other thing is this weakness that we talked about before. I actually think it's a strength, right? So here's Gina Kapos' quote, right? This is the standard criticism of agent-based models, that people's behavior change, and therefore, you know, these things don't work. But like, here's this, you know, you can do this for anything. Here's beverage curves, right? So unemployment <coughs> rate. And you know what? It looks like people's, the world did change, right? So if the world did change, you wouldn't expect one model to always fit this. In fact, it can't. But five models could, right? The question is, can you anticipate the change? Can you, by looking at the data ahead of time, can you see you know, when, when Doan sees this break in 2000, the ex post you saw the break, looking back from 2012, could you see it in fall of 2000 if you'd been collecting data all along? She said, well, this just doesn't seem to be fitting. We're seeing like a level data that looks fitting. Okay, last two points. One here is that physicists think, tend to think in terms of distribution, both of them distributions, those sorts of things. Ecologists tend to think in terms of systems that evolve. So there's a lot of work going on in other disciplines that addresses some of the questions we're concerned about as well, such as massive collapses. There's some really out there work by a friend of mine, John Doyle, on what he called highly optimized tolerance, where he talks about highly optimized systems sometimes collapse. And what's interesting is addressing the same sort of questions, right, that we care a lot about in economics, but it's a very different way of thinking about it. It's thinking about all these systems adapting and responding to each other, possibly creating a system that's fragile, which is these large events, as opposed to some sort of res response. And that leads to the distinction between 
the difference between robustness and stability. So when we think of these frames, you know, I was trained to do, um, in you know, graduate school in econ, stability analysis, right? We basically sort of, you know, do the equilibrium and then you compute the exponents and you figure out, like, is this thing stable? Lots of Jacobians and that sort of stuff, which is great. And so, like, do you go back to the same or nearby equilibrium? Robustness means something different. It means the ability to maintain functionality, possibly in a completely different way. So when you take a species out of an ecosystem, that's not a stable system in the traditional sense. It doesn't go back to the same equilibrium with some sort of slight change. It actually maintains its functionality, but it does so in a completely different way. So again, this is this idea that when you start modeling things from a complex systems perspective, you're just looking through a different lens. So if you look at things, this is the Lovarin work again. And again, this was just sort of a play model. But he looks at sort of, you know, here's heterogeneity of those training rules. How much heterogeneity is there in the ideas people have in their heads? And here's other crashes. And what you see is these crashes actually sort of come about, or come about because you see a lot of fall off in heterogeneity. So heterogeneity sort of disappears, and then the market crashes. And so there's a question, like this is why this, this is where this dovetails nicely with the attention literature. People have cognitive constraints. What are people thinking about? And are people thinking the same way? I think you see some interplay between the two models. Last point, and then I'll finish. I think when I think about this, and this is why I was so um, I was so pleased to be invited. Is, so my PhD is with, with, with Roger Meyerson on the north side of Chicago. So we were all Cubs fans, right? In Chicago on the south side. In the north side, um, people say, "Let's play two after Ernie Banks, right?" And we're playing two baseball games. But there's a theorem that comes from forecasting that loosely I call the first prediction theorem. Where this is the um, crowd minus the truth. So the crowd's error equals the average error of the people in the crowd minus the diversity of those models. <coughs> so if I want to ask how well we can forecast something, it depends on having two things. It depends on having uh, models that are good and also models that are negatively correlated in some way. So one thing that really intrigues me about this agent based approach is it's making fundamentally different assumptions. Right? It's thinking about the world in a completely different way, which means it's likely to be fairly highly negatively correlated with the way we're thinking about things now. So if you have to ask in terms of our general contribution to knowledge, it actually doesn't have to be that accurate, <laughs> given it's so much more diverse, to be of value. But I think the interesting thing about this is that we can't know how accurate, unlike, I think, other approaches, like including networks into economics or something like this, you can't just do this with one small paper. It takes sort of big teams of people and fairly large enterprises. The question's going to be, um, do we believe it's going to pay off? And I think that because we can leverage things going on other disciplines, because there's so much more data, because there's so much more computer power, I think it's probably worth the risk, or at least the uncertainty. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now it is uh, time for the discussion. It's Domenico Feligatti. Inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. I apologize for not being a, being a good discussion because of one of the tasks of the discussion to summarize the talk it was so rich that it's almost <laughs> impossible. So we we'll did at least uh, half of the of the discussion. So let me do the following. Let me put some order somehow in the list of models that uh, Scott has uh, very thoroughly uh, presented here. The, the large uh, set here is the set of agent-based model. Within the set of agent-based model, we have a subset of agent-based, uh, agent, uh, excuse me, um, agent-based computational economics. Here you have, the, the, for instance, the papers uh, by Axtell or uh, or uh, Blake Le Baron on uh, uh, partial equilibrium, and then. There is a subset of models in this area that are the macro agent based model that I would like to uh, discuss a little bit in uh, more detail. That's the art of the soup. I hope this uh, uh, list is uh, somehow uh, clarifying the issue. The general uh, tool is uh, agent based model that can be applied to different disciplines. Then you go in detail in agent based computational economics and you have everything here all the macro, micro and macro model, um, partial equilibrium of general, of, excuse me, uh, market models or economy-wide models. 
And then you have the macro economy, which can be conceived of as a complex hierarchy system. At that point, the macro region based model actually trying to uh, make uh, uh, a description of this uh, macro economy uh, using the tools of region based modeling. In this case, you simply add up individual quantities and get something that uh, are aggregate quantities, so for instance, GDP consumption and so on and so forth. So this is the typical from, from the bottom up. Uh, methodological assumption. Uh, how to do a um, macro agent based model? Uh, well, you start from a population of heterogeneous agents, so households, firms, banks, that are, can be heterogeneous from a different uh, points of view. Then you write behavioral rules, that's theory that uh, comes in here because it is actually dictating the way in which uh, you want to write behavioral rules. For instance, demand and supply of goods, labor, and credit. Uh, when you have uh, the model in place, uh, you go for uh, the codification, translate these rules into code lines, and then the validation part. First of all, you calibrate the parameters, you run simulation, so <coughs> you produce artificial or simulated data, you analyze the properties of the simulated data. Scott has been quite uh, keen on this, discussing the emergent properties of uh, agent based models. And then you compare these properties with the world style aspects. That's the empirical corroboration of region based models. So, uh, what are the main features of macro region based theorizing? Uh, there is an incomplete list, but I think these are the most important ingredients. Heterogeneity, of course, you start with that. And that's the reason why you build these kind of models. You don't want, you don't want to use the representative agent assumption. Then interaction. Generally, it is local because there are costs of uh, interacting with uh, all of the people in a large population. Uh, sometimes it is global. There is a third ingredient which is uh, somehow controversial. There is a, uh, in the community of agent based modelers, uh, most of the people prefer to have agents that are bounded relational, so uh, they choose, uh, their, their choices are. Uh, the term dictated by rules of thumb, but not necessarily so. Uh, fourth uh, ingredient is adaptive behavior, and then uh, out of equilibrium dynamics. Not always, not necessarily. That's my personal, personal uh, somehow agnostic approach to agent based modeling. Uh, that's what uh, uh, already uh, told you essentially. Uh, most of the agent based modelers generally prefer to assume that agents are. Uh, actually, not global optimizer and use simple rules, so rules of thumb. Uh, my impression is that, uh, in principle, you can have behavioral rules that are actually uh, determined uh, not only in the case of boundary rationality, but depending on the context also from sp specific optimization problems. So, there can be also optimal rules. Uh, changes in behavior are driven by shocks, both in idiosyncratic and aggregate, and by learning processes. That's adaptation. Uh, one more point on how to equilibrium dynamics. Agent based models generally prefer to assume that markets are systematically in this equilibrium. So, uh, but in principle, however, at least some markets can be in equilibrium or converge to a quasi equilibrium faster than other markets. The, it is easy to uh, accommodate the fact that markets can actually uh, work at different time scales. That's important and I think uh, uh, comparative advantage of. Uh, uh, Asian based models with respect to standard macro models. Now, the interesting thing is that if you follow this kind of uh, modeling tools, you get very easily the following. Due to interaction, you have uh, very easily the emergence of externalities and nonlinearities, and dynamic processes with positive feedbacks. However, generally, uh, a complex relative economy displays a, a self organization towards a stable aggregate configuration, which sometimes in this literature is called quasi-stationary equilibrium. Uh, the interesting thing is that this uh, equilibrium is sometimes uh, punctuated by burst of rapid change. Uh, so this is one possible, these are 4,000 periods, so that's, uh, but it's uh, what you get if you simply adapt individual quantities into something like looks like uh, total GDP. Now, let me uh, <coughs> focus a little bit on the realized uh, uh, potential so far of agent-based, 
a region-based model into matrix uh, contribution, a region-based model into matrix economics. Uh, there are at least uh, uh, three or four uh, um, uh, branch of this literature, which is still in its infancy, as uh, uh, um, uh, Scott has uh, uh, correctly pointed out. The one is this, the, 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 the literature uh, that has been pioneered, for instance, by Howitt. Uh, we, uh, me and Mauro Gallegati in Ancona and our friends in Italy have uh, actually worked in this uh, area for a, long, uh, for a long while. And it's uh, one part of the story. In here, in here, you have the models that are characterized by the fact that financial factors are playing a very important role. So we have uh, actually uh, incorporated the idea of financial accelerator into an agent based model with heterogeneous financial conditions. There are also models that are actually focusing on the medium to long run. For instance, uh, the, the model that has been uh, produced by Dozi and uh, uh, co-authors in Santana. Here, the technical progress is interacting with financial factors, so there is a different kind of focus. There is a third type of uh, uh, literature, uh, which is actually uh, focusing on interplay between labor market and technical progress. This is the called UAE's project, and now it uh, that Scott has uh, just uh, mentioned before, is one of the contributors to this literature. Uh, yeah. uh, one thing that is interesting is also that uh, a complementary line of research, the line of research on uh, uh, agent-based model of the financial market, where, where, where heterogeneous expectations play an important role. Uh, these models have been uh, in the literature for a while. They are more focused on a particular market, which is the stock market. But of course, what uh, it could be interesting to do is to put together these two lines of research. We are actually, let me make some advertising too. Uh, we are actually trying to uh, make an encompassing effort in this uh, huge research project at European level, which is called Complexity Based Research Initiative for Systemic Instabilities, and uh, build a model which is actually incorporating uh, these uh, features. So something is already there, uh, it's not just uh, the potential. Uh, but also uh, some contribution. Uh, but what, let, me, let me try to, be, uh, um, to, to find out ways of comparing uh, the results that we already have with the, uh, with the standard macro literature and what the agent-based models can contribute to the macro debate. Uh, the, uh, well, the strong point, the strength of agent-based model is that they can reproduce uh, the empirical evidence at the cross-sectional level. So these models, all of them, or most of them, are able to reproduce, for instance, the fact that the distribution of firm size is skewed, uh, and sometimes is a power law, and the distribution of firm growth rates is stand-shaped. Uh, so this is something that uh, the standard agent, the, the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model based on the representative agent by construction cannot do. Uh, who cares? One can also comment uh, about uh, there are consequences, for instance, in terms of macro uh, uh, impact of idiosyncratic shock if, for instance, the distribution of firm size is skewed, as uh, recent work by Gabe has shown. Uh, as far as the uh, uh, aggregate evidence, uh, the macro agent based model can reproduce the empirical evidence at the aggregate level, at least qualitatively. They may not be used so far for uh, macroeconomic uh, forecasts. Uh, we are not there yet, uh, so from this point of view, there's a long way to go. Uh, potentially, potentially, once empirically implemented with the specific needs of macroeconomic forecast in mind, agent-based model will be used to generate macroeconomic forecasts. Another thing that probably agent-based model can do uh, more effectively, I think, than uh, standard new Keynesian DHG model is that uh, they can be used to generate early warning signals of an incoming crisis because they can accommodate domino effects and therefore systemic risk. My bet is that it will take years, not decades, but it will take a uh, uh, certain time. Uh, very briefly on two, at least uh, in my view, promising lines of research. One is that you can make hybrid models. Uh, so we can, uh, the attempt is to nest an agent-based model into a macroeconomic model. Uh, this, uh, 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 this is uh, the idea. Uh, the agent-based model can generate artificial data, which are summarized in a macroeconomic variable, an aggregate variable, 
And then this variable can be uh, plugged into the macroeconomic model. Uh, for instance, uh, suppose that you have a, a model of the stock market in which there are heterogeneous expectations. You produce a stock market index out of this agent-based model, and you plug this into the macroeconomic model with uh, um, um, asset prices. And then there is a two-way feedback between the agent-based model and the macroeconomic component of the model, because the macroeconomic model generates aggregate variables that are important for the agent-based model nested into uh, this hybrid model. For instance, the interest rate. Uh, that's uh, something that we are working uh, on. There are some uh, examples in the literature, but this is something that uh, there's a long way uh, to go again. The other thing which is, uh, I think, uh, quite interesting, the, the, the literature here is uh, growing quite rapidly, is the idea of uh, casting uh, the agent-based model into network terms. So, in a, in a sense, you are imposing a network structure on a, the agent-based model. If you go back to macro agent-based model that I told you before, there is no network structure there. There are transactions, of course, but uh, these, uh, it is as if the network of transactions were reshuffled every period. So there are no partner choice, no customer relationship. But it's not very complicated to add a network structure on an agent-based model to customer relationship, for instance, between firms and banks. And to assume that the topology of network is changing over time by changes in, in partner choice. And it's quite easy to see that uh, this is conducive to dominant effects. Uh, so these are the two lines of literature that uh, I think it would be important. So that's, that's uh, the state of the art so far. So it's in, in, in its infancy, but some results are already there. Thanks. Thank you very much. And, uh, yes, but first, would you, uh, uh, Scott, would you like Oh, no, to? it's great. Yes, yeah, it's fine. OK, then I think David was yeah, first. I, 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 I'd like to correct a myth that Scott perpetuates, and that is if you think of the beverage curve, yeah. think of any three-dimensional relationship projected yeah. down onto two dimensions, it'll shift. Yeah. It does not mean you need different models for each curve. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no way you can infer that from that yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a myth I see often occurring in, in reasoning about economics. I mean, it could depend on the real wage, it could depend on inflation, it could depend on you know, government, all sorts of things. It could easily be a constant parameter, a very simple three-dimensional model. So I, I don't think things like that are... Yeah, no. Yeah, would you like to answer? Well, no, yeah. I, I accept the question. <laughs> okay, yes, yes. So. Yeah, uh, it's a two-part question. First, so you mentioned that the main criticism is the rules changing. Yeah. Um, what's your recommendation of how to deal with that? And secondly, so since most of this is simulation based, um, is there a sort of is there sort of a dependence on the source of randomness that that, that induces these that there works in the simulations or about how how sensitive are the results to initializations? Okay, so let me take the, the second one first. So the sensitivity of the results to the initial conditions um, is something that we, one of the things that we try and study sort of useful foundational work in complex systems, right? Trying to understand the degrees of path dependence, right, of these systems and coming up with just even new ways to measure them, to understand, you know, what causes the system to be path dependent or not. In terms of brand, one of the things I think is important to think about here, and this is the sort of the, I think the frame shift, is, you know, use the word uncertainty. When I'm around economists, there's like with uncertainty and beliefs, but there's a distinction between uncertainty and complexity. And there's also a distinction between uncertainty, complexity, and difficulty in terms of sort of standard problem difficulty measures you'd use in computer science. And so on complex systems, it's rarely the uncertainty that you put into the system that matters that much. It's the heterogeneity of the actors and the interdependencies between them that produce these stochastic patterns. The things that, that when you look at them as data, right, they look random, but in fact are actually produced by the system. So it's rarely the randomness you put in that matters as much as the complexity that comes out. Right? And that heterogeneity in a lot of these models can emerge even from, you know, sort of as the initial symmetry in the model breaks for whatever reason, um, that then you can produce the same sort of, you know, that you get these sort of interesting patterns going. In terms of like, you know, when do you, and this, and the, the, I mean, I abs absolutely accept the point that whenever you project a higher dimensional thing on the two dimensions, you can see shifts. But I think that it's also the case that if you look at, um, the point I was trying to make, if you look at behavior in labor markets, and you look at, you know, particularly, just the role of women in the labor market, right? The, I think the fundamental dynamics in terms of vacancy rates versus have, have changed, and I think that the, the, large, the point I should have made very specifically, I should have made exactly that point, right? That 
the inclusion of you know, the United States, this massive movement of women in the labor market has had a huge effect on decisions to move or not move, and probably changed the fundamental relationship between vacancy rates and unemployment rates. So in, and so it's interesting to think about in these um, situations, you know, is it a parameter change in some sense, or is it um, a behavioral change? Because a lot of behavioral changes are just the same behavior with a different parameter, right? Yeah. Breaks out need breaks in. You break in is that women are entering the labor force, and that's pretty obvious. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, so whether you then model it as a constant parameter model with the female participation rate changing, or you model it as a shift in the parameter of the two dimensions of the modeling charts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah fair enough. No, that, that was going to be sometimes yeah. an answer to the other question is, right? Sometimes you can, you can do, probably do it either way. So I think you were the next one. Uh, did oh, you want to say something? You, you said the other, yeah. 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 Uh, sorry, then it, it's yeah, the last one. Um, so. Yes, yeah, so in both books you basically contrasted sort of your model of heterogeneity with, um, say, the standard uh, New Keynesian homogeneous model. Right. But there's also this literature starting with Chrisel Smith and Martin Hans, and a lot of work on that, that sort of takes sort of more traditional uh, macro models and adds heterogeneity to that. Right. And so what would you, how would you compare those literatures? And yeah, for one thing, I think that other literature is sort of more robust in Lucas critique, so in that sense, mm -hmm. I think sort of, that literature may have that particular advantage. But what do you see as a particular advantage of the sort of your agent-based modeling type of uh, type of research, apart from producing much cooler graphs? I think <laughs> see, uh, that there's a role maybe from the other. But I'm sure you, you will have other uh, uh, takes on this. So how would you compress those literatures and, and, and assess the relative strengths and weaknesses? Of so in the first case, I mean, again, this is a, in the first case, let's take you know heterogeneity in terms of risk or wealth or preferences or something like that, right? What you're doing in the in that or you know just even beliefs, you then still sort of aggregate and find and sort of, some sort of people optimize and ask how does this affect you know what's going to happen in the economy? When you throw in things like budget constraints, then you get actually a fairly large effect. But it's still the case that each person in some sense optimizing, and the general framework is one that sort of moves like this. In the agent based model, like if you think of the LeBrand graph, where the graphs are much more they aren't more interesting, I think that's maybe problematic, not a feature. Um, you think of the system in some sense, and I think um, you described it better than I did, is each person's following these rules, and what you get, that's why I said they, they should be called systems that can be complex. Because oftentimes, economic systems, because of a lot of sort of, you know, constraints, you know, that, that define economic systems, tend to go to these, you know, what do you want to call quasi-equilibria, stochastic equilibria, whatever, but they tend to be fairly robust and stable. But the thing is, when you think about then a policy change, in the one change, in the first case, it's beliefs that are changing. In the other case, it's behaviors that are, you know, you're sort of modeling these suites of behaviors. And I think that there's this interesting interplay, like with the attention models and things like that. There you're talking about, are people attending to the information? But in this other case, you're talking about people sort of like, are they changing their beliefs? Are they, are they changing their behaviors? And so it's just, in some sense, it's just a completely different paradigm that way, right? And so in one case, you're sort of going like this. In another case, everything's just sort of groping and moving. But I don't think we know. To be perfectly honest, I mean, don't they want to go? And I think that this is one of the things that people who work in this space care deeply about. Suppose you go to this alternative paradigm. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? I mean, does it, does the other model, suppose we find that it doesn't give us anything, then it gives us a lot. <laughs> right? My question is related, but maybe put it in another way. So, some of us went to a conference with Andy Halday in a year or so ago, where we saw some things by some very nice mathematical biologists doing agent based modeling. Mm -hmm. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. They're very, very good indeed, very interesting. But there's also another dimension of the agent-based modeling that I think you haven't addressed, and it was just mentioned. Yeah. But many of us think there's a lot wrong with DSG models because it's a single representative agent. However, a large proportion of the economics profession don't see anything particularly wrong with the concept of maximizing. And I think that you throw it, you, the agent-based modeling you're looking at throws out the concept of constraint maximization to an extent. Now, there is a literature that I'd like to comment on yeah. about diverse maximizing agents. So, for instance, you can calibrate the agents of a household survey. We've got two or three strands of that in the UK, where people calibrate 10,000 agents of the household survey, and each of those agents maximizes subject to constraints in the policy problem they're set. Right. That can be very revealing indeed. The people doing that work are well, there's Justin van der Ben, there's um, Rutte den Haan, there's mentioned as doing slightly smaller ones, 
There's somebody at Cambridge whose name I shouldn't forget because I've seen them twice in the last year doing it in relation to IFS. It's very interesting work because you can see where the DSG model might be telling you something, where the DSG model and the rest of macroeconomics might not be telling you something. You can investigate uh, things like the complexity of the number of constrained consumers in that. You can investigate things like myopia and learn things about them. So it's a strand of agent-based modeling that many of us would think is a, a very sensible way forward for macroeconomics. Right. It does still depend on maximizing behavior rather than complexity. Yeah, so well, so actually it turns out that, that so tell me if you there's there's this interesting sort of gray area between what's rule-based behavior and what's optimizing behavior. So if I write down a utility function of some sort and then I solve for the optimal action, oftentimes that ends up being like let's take a complex utility function. That ends up giving me a rule that says I should spend 30% of my money on housing, 40%, that becomes a rule. And so anytime I write down a rule, I could write down a utility function for which that rule was an optimal thing to do with some provisors. You can't always do it with a lot of times you can. So if you look at Axtell's work in particular, I think it's really interesting because he, Rob as much as anybody, really you know, plays up the agent-based model. But if you actually look at his models, he typically has cognitive utility functions and the rule that his agents are following is the utility maximizing rule. <laughs> so you know, very rarely we see someone write down an agent-based model where the rule people are following is a crazy rule, right? And it's usually, right? You know, and so, um, and oftentimes now, there's a lot of really major based models where they throw in sort of these behavioral rules that come from psychology. Um, but I, I take it, but I think it's interesting. I think one of these is the bad advertising. I think that there was sort of this, um, people working in the HMA community early on were, I think, overly provocative and sort of said, people don't optimize their following rules, and then wrote down rules that were optimizing rules. But now we have so they're work. secretly macro -economic. But there's now people trying to solve macro problems. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Based models with the recovery yeah, 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 yeah. Which is very interesting. Well, the stuff I talk about with the, the Procter & Gamble stuff, right? they literally do have massive agent-based models where they break consumers into types, right? And different preference types and also different attention types. And they do exactly that. With the very much, you know, for, for things like the toothpaste market and the soap market. And that's doing exactly what you said. Yes, I think you are now. Yes, right. In fact, I'm a bit confused uh, taking on the same discussion because I think you know, all the ingredients you are talking about yeah. could be uh, put into a complicated uh, DSG model with plenty of agents who are in a network, interact locally. Uh, but, so this is exactly right? what I said. And you could have the same emergent properties that you know we could look at by, instead of calling them emergent, we just look at the spectrum and find that there are you know, uh, some, uh, some properties uh, that's, that looks like patterns, except that we express it in the language that we are used to in terms of uh, stochastic uh, time series analysis. On the other hand, it seems to me that uh, you are a little bit bound by this rules approach, which I, I like a lot, but which is not completely uh, void of uh, commitment. <laughs> Because, okay, the rule can be optimizing in a policy regime, but then when you change the policy regime in a DSG model, people will instantaneously compute the new rule. Yeah. And I guess there you have to take a stand, right? Because if your, uh, if your game is a game where people are tattling with different rules, then you are assuming some adaptive expectations in the sense that people will only gradually, gradually learn uh, the new rule when there is a policy origin change. So, um, so in some sense, the burden rationality aspect is uh, somewhat inevitable as long as you contemplate uh, changes in the policy origin. Yeah, so two quick comments. First one is that, I mean, so, yeah, it's not me so much as like this approach. So most of my work is actually done in the mathematical realm. And, you know, some of it's done in this realm. I'm interested in the interplay between these two things. So your first point about the DSG plus thing, and I, I you know, couldn't agree with Mark more when we talked today about there is this, I think there's this real value from taking a DSG model and add this, pull some of that stuff back, add this, pull that back, add this, and construct this suite of models. I mean, my last slide basically says, look, I, I absolutely think that's fundamental. Right? I think one of the issues is once you start doing plus, 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 then I think the um, you can no longer sort of get the closed form solution. And also I talk about, you know, it's not like, you know, pick up both legs, the whole thing falls apart. I think it's this slow degradation. As you start adding all the pluses, 
you then, then we, suddenly it starts to look more like a complex system and less like an equilibrium, equilibrium system, right? And I think that that's the space we want to explore. I mean, so, I mean, so here's a really interesting scientific question. I've got something out there, and, I can, and it's got 15 things that matter. I can only do mathematics on things that are of size 6. So I do all possible combinations of size 6. 15 to 6 is big. Lots of us can get 10 here. That's great. <laughs> right? So we do those, you know, have a suite of models, as Mark said. That's going to work pretty well, I honestly think. Then we can also write kind of a sloppier model with all 15, right? Or, you know, maybe a, a huge computational model. Thing. And let's see what that looks like compared to the ones with 6. And I think we learn something from that. That's my point. So my point is not that we should all be agent-based modeling, just charging out of the room. My point is that in the, I, I believe that in the suite of things we do, given the success of this approach to things like ecology and disease and things like that, I just think it's in our interest collectively, especially in light of recent events, someone might say, that uh, we do this stuff. Uh, Needles is the next one. So um, you just mentioned something that's come up several times, and that's what do we learn from these models? And I think it's, it's a very serious question. Yeah. Um, and part of what, what you're describing and we're learning from are the properties of the models. But another part, yeah. which you emphasized about two-thirds of the way through, is that we're actually interested in some of the economic data that are present. Yeah, yeah, As you yeah. described, you know, looking at distributions and we've got thick tails <coughs> or skewness, things like that. And that's very, very important to start doing. How far can we push the evaluation either now with models or in the future? So take the example of distribution. You might have the distribution of the data and the theory match exactly, but every time the data go up, the model predicts going down. Well, there's something wrong there. And so we need stronger evaluation criteria. And also that's useful in terms of comparing the models, because some models might do very well in terms of, if you wish, predicting the levels, but horribly on the growth rates, whereas another might do very well the other way around. Right. And there's a lot in econometrics that's been developed along those lines. And so it'd be interesting to see how far, either now or within a few years, we can push that. I agree. No, I absolutely agree. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Danny. 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 We're all friends. Be nice. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you both for uh, really interesting, really interesting presentations. Yeah. Scott, I wanted to press you on something. Yeah. Um, you know, when you began, you talked about a whole range of interesting ideas. Among yeah. them, emergence. Right. This, this idea about how systemic properties might be different from an individual. Right. And among them, of course, it's really interesting to use that to think, for instance, about inequality right. in society. There's no such thing as the inequality for one person. Right. Inequality is something that only society can have. <coughs> and then, but then after that, you went to almost like a, a horse race, mechanistic, instrumentalist discussion yeah. of the advantages of the, the ABMs. Right, right, right. And I wonder if you feel that we've run out of interesting insights from conceptual, theoretical insights from, from emergence in this discussion. Perhaps what macro needs are it's more of those perhaps what macro needs and what to value. More of these elegant insights about synchronous behavior, inequality, emergent outcomes, rather than only horse races, computer-based horse races. I absolutely agree. And if, let me, I'll just end. There's a wonderful recent article by um, Terence Tao, who's probably you know, the top two or three yeah. living mathematicians mm -hmm. at uh, UCLA, where he basically rephrases your question, which says that because you know, we understand the central limit theorem, and we understand the Boltzmann distribution, but there's all these other distributions that sort of emerge from complex processes that we really don't understand very well at all. And it, when we think about, you know, so we have some, you know, you can think about with chaos, you've got like, you know, finding bound numbers and stuff like that. But he believes there's all sorts of just fundamental things about complex systems that are still a mystery. And so I think that if you think of the parts of emergence that we know compared to the parts of emergence, especially at the distributional level, that we don't know, um, it's very small. So I think that there's a lot that can happen. I think it's going to take people possibly trained in mathematics and physics, you know, to really push that forward maybe more than uh, uh, I'm getting the yang. <laughs> we are, we are about to run out of time, and, and uh, we started five minutes late, and, and the question is, we could have one more, and then okay. I think we have to close. <laughs> Unfortunately, the list is still long, but, but time has run out. Just a, a brief yeah. quick comment on the DSG plus agenda versus yeah. another question on DSG plus. I think you know, it's, it's terrific that there's efforts to bring heterogeneity into DSG models and uh, you 
and networks and, and so on. But we should recognize there is a difference between that approach and this, which is, and this is, a, I had an experience in 2006 of trying to bring household uh, balance sheet heterogeneity into the PSG model. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I kept getting happy landings, uh, <laughs> is the way I describe it. And, you know, because things were going back to equilibrium and controls and all the usual things. And these models, by removing the constraints for, from the equilibrium, you can get uh, nonlinear and dynamic interactions between the agents uh, that, you know, if you're constrained in an equilibrium framework, you just won't see. So, so I think you know, both uh, research programs are valuable and, and should be talking to each other, but they, they are different. They don't necessarily kind of meet in the, in the uh, same place. People got nonlinearities ages ago in yeah. an equilibrium model, including pretty simple models. And this literature sort of died out because people are really more in stochastic shots rather than deterministic <coughs> science. And it's not difficult to get nonlinearity in a the yes, no matter. But, and what I wanted to say is that, you know, I think yeah. time is out. I think yeah. you have yeah. to yeah. discuss, yeah. discuss, yeah. It, yeah. discuss yeah. it together. We'll discuss it offline, but I think there is, yeah. there is a difference here. Uh, and, then, and then the question I wanted to ask was, yeah. Yeah. You know, the great promise you ended with, Scott, is the ability of these models to explain and confront data. Uh, and, and, and a challenge for this agenda is to move from the toy models that we've seen. That how do you avoid problems of overfitting with you know, so many free parameters, so many agents? Uh, and how can you have you know, confidence in the challenges you have? What's being I mean, think people seem ready to go, but I think that the, I think have to look more towards computer science in terms of you know, what they do a lot more sort of you know, breaking the data into two sets or leaving some parameters free, right? So you fit some. If you have a model that claims it's going to fit eight, and you only fit four, and you're blinded to the other four, and then you see. So that's, a, that's a larger. But I think we have to look to other disciplines to see how they come up with it. Thank you very much. Thanks.